Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Asian Impact Webinar organized by the Asian Development Bank. I'm Xu Tian from the Economic Research and Development Impact Department. Today, we have with us a team of ADB economists and experts to discuss one of the most important development agenda we are facing now, climate change. Uh, with each passing year, the effects of climate change are uh, increasingly visible in developing Asia, from floods to droughts to devastating storms. The region is one of the world's most vulnerable of, to climate change. To reach Paris Agreement climate goals, the world must achieve the net zero emissions during the century. What will the global transition to net zero mean to developing Asia? The ADB released Asian Development Outlook 2023 thematic report, Asia in the Global Transition to Net Zero, to discuss this question. We have here today Dr. Manisha Pardananga, economist at ADB's Economic Research and Development Impact Department, to share with us the key messages of this report. Without further ado, I will pass over to her. Manisha, the floor is yours. Thank you, Grace. Um, let me take a moment to share my screen. All right, so um, thank you, Grace, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, today, I'll be presenting the Asian Development Outlook thematic report titled Asia in the Global Transition to Net Zero, which was launched in April. Um, the report examines what a net zero world would mean for developing Asia under different climate scenarios. We'll look at key transformations in the energy sector and in land use, and also uh, the socioeconomic consequences of this transition. So overall, the report is divided into four main sections. Um, let me just go through it very quickly. The first section uh, discusses Asia's stake in the climate um, change, examine the region's climate vulnerability, as well as the implications of its development trajectory on emissions. The second section looks, um, it's, it basically sets up the modeling framework and analyzes how major emitting sectors in the region would evolve under different emissions pathways. The third section examines the potential socioeconomic consequences of a low carbon transition in terms of policy costs, benefits from reduced climate change, co-benefits from better air quality, uh, labor market outcomes, and also implications for equity. Finally, we end uh, the report offering some policy recommendations to ensure that the transition is efficient and equitable. So as we know, um, developing Asia contains one of the most vulnerable populations to climate change in the world. Uh, its geographic features, along with socioeconomic conditions, exposes most, uh, much of the population to climate-related risks and stress, uh, stresses. Um, these figures, the, these four charts, show uh, that under IPCC's high emission scenario, the region uh, stands to lose almost a quarter of GDP by 2100, with higher losses of about 35% in India and about 32% in Southeast Asia. Overall, in the near term, river flooding losses are found to be the dominant channel of loss across most of developing Asia, while agriculture losses are going to be more important in the longer term. So although historically emissions from developing Asia have been low, they have been growing very fast um, since the 1980s, so growing faster than the global average. Um, its share, developing Asia's share of global emissions doubled from up to about 22% in 1990 to 44% in 2019. However, there are signs of progress. So climate change is increasingly being recognized by um, uh, most countries around the globe, including in developing Asia as important. All Paris Agreement parties from the region have submitted nationally determined contributions or NDCs, and 19 developing Asian economies have announced net zero pledges, which represents about 80% of the region's emissions. So in this report, we conduct modeling using the world-induced technical change hybrid or WITCH model, which is the third most um, integrate, uh, used integrated assessment model, uh, IAM, in the IPCC six assessment report. Uh, it has several attractive, feature, attractive feature, features, including a detailed energy sector, which is linked to a land use model. Uh, it's also possible to account for technical change within the model via learning, by doing, and by research. Um, so getting into some of the details of the modeling uh, in the report, we model five core scenarios that embody key policy choices for climate change. 
These include scenarios based on current policies. So the first one and NDCs, that's the second one. Um, and along with NDCs and net zero pledges, that's our third scenario, the uncoordinated net zero. Uh, in addition, we model two optimal global net zero scenarios, um, the global net zero and the accelerated global net zero in the, in the table that you see here. Um, in these two models, uh, there is international cooperation through carbon markets. So overall, the global net zero scenario follows NDCs until 2030, and then there's a coordinated global effort uh, to stay within the carbon budget to achieve Paris Agreement goals. Uh, whereas in the accelerated global net zero scenario, that effort, the, the global coordinated effort begins immediately. Um, overall, the results uh, are presented uh, for the three major emitters in the region, PRC, India, and Indonesia, and the rest of Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia, rest of South Asia, along with Caucasus and Central Asia. As is common in, in, in these kinds of models, emission reductions are driven by carbon prices. Okay, uh, these charts uh, show the, the CO2 emissions pathways for the world and developing Asia under the five climate scenarios that I just described. So under current policies, which is the gray line at the top, we expect mean warming of about three degrees centigrade by the end of the century, which decreases to about 2.4 degrees, uh, the blue line under NDC effort. This is overall consistent with the broad recognition that current NDCs are insufficient to achieve Paris Agreement goals. If we include the net zero pledges, that takes us closer to Paris Agreement goals with about two degree of mean warming. That's the red line that you see in the chart. Um, but given the uncertain probability of staying within the two degree goal of the Paris Agreement, this does not technically achieve the well below two degree goal. Um, <clears throat> the last two lines, the green and the yellow one are the global net zero and the accelerated global net zero. Um, these are implemented under stringent carbon budgets, um, and so these are the only scenarios in our, in our report that are consistent with Paris Agreement goals, uh, leading to a mean warming of about 1.7 degrees centigrade by the end of the century. This has a higher uh, than 67% probability of staying below 2 degrees. Um, as the, the action starts immediately under accelerated global net zero, it allows for a smoother transition in the future, while global net zero requires more stringent climate action in the future to stay within the carbon budget. Okay, so presenting some of the results um, of the modeling exercise, this chart shows the main sources of mitigation under the accelerated global net zero scenario for developing Asia. As you can see, energy efficiency, which is the orange portion of the line um, of the chart, is the most important source of emission reductions before 2040, followed by emission reductions from agriculture and land use. These are the dark uh, and light green at the top. This is because more energy efficient behavior and uh, energy consuming uh, devices can be adopted more quickly, and many emissions from agriculture practices and deforestation can also be curtailed quickly. Change in energy mix um, <clears throat> to transition to cleaner sources, so this is the yellow portion of the chart, will be critical by mid-century um, as scaling of renewables will take some time. Finally, emerging and costly technologies such as carbon capture and storage, CCS, this is the gray part of the chart, will only play an important role after 2050. Looking more closely into the energy sector is the largest source of emissions. It, uh, it will go rapid transformation. Achieving Paris Agreement goals will require a decrease in primary energy demand and a shift towards cleaner sources. So under current policies on the left chart, total primary energy in the region is projected to increase by about 50% by 2070, while under accelerated global net zero, this will slow down a bit. This decline in primary energy supply is par par partly due to decline in energy intensity of GDP, which decreases by almost 60% by 2050. These energy intensity improvements can be um, driven by a range of um, uh, factors such as technology, um, uh, structure of the economy, along with behavioral changes such as adoption of energy saving technology and uh, energy saving behavior. If you look closely within the energy sector, um, electricity generation is the largest source of emissions. The share, a share of coal in electricity generation will decline even under the current policy scenario from about 60% in 2020 to 17% 70, by 2050 and further to just 7% by 2070. 
Under accelerated global net zero, coal will have virtually no place in, in Asia's electricity sector, while, uh, while wind and solar uh, power will provide more than three-fourths of the region's energy needs. This is not to say that phase out of coal at the speed and scale that's required to, to uh, meet Paris Agreement goals will be easy or inevitable. Uh, given a limited carbon pricing in the region and the existence of market rigidity, such as long-term uh, purchasing power agreements, mean that innovative programs such as ADB's energy transition mechanism will be needed for early retirement of coal. So looking at the policy costs of the transition, <clears throat> the overall cost of uh, pursuing uh, global net zero, this is the accelerated scenario, is about 0.9% of GDP for the region as a whole um, in 2030. Uh, it decreases to about 0.7% in 2050 and 1.3% in 2070. So this is the green um, bars to the left um, chart. Pursuing individual country net zero pledges in an uncoordinated manner. This is the, uh, the orange bar that you see in the chart. Um, and this is the uncoordinated net zero scenario in our modeling. This leads to higher overall costs. This is because mitigation effort is not allocated where it is cheapest. Um, and on the right chart, you see that fossil fuel exporting um, regions, including the Caucasus and Central Asia, will have more reduction in economic um, activity than do fossil fuel importers and countries that start from a low, um, low level of per capita emissions, such as uh, India and uh, the, the rest of South Asia. Um, decarbonization will generate important co-benefits beyond climate benefits, and one major co-benefit is air quality. So fossil fuel-based energy generates a range of air pollutants that are damaging both to human health and also natural ecosystems. In 2019, one in nine deaths worldwide were caused by fine particulate matter, PM2.5, and ozone air pollution. Six of the 10 cities with highest population-weighted PM2.5 exposure globally are in the region. So under our accelerated net zero scenario, uh, 346,000 premature deaths can be avoided annually by 2030 in the region due to air pollution. Okay, these set of charts um, puts together the costs and benefits of climate action. Um, the green parts are policy costs of climate change, orange is the benefits of averted climate damages, and blue is the air quality benefits. Overall, net present values of co-benefits and benefits are five times policy costs in developing Asia under the accelerated global net zero scenario. This ranges between three to 11 times policy costs for different subregions and countries that we've analyzed. <clears throat> so as accelerated net zero uh, both has lower overall costs and starts the flow of benefits and co-benefits earlier than other net zero scenarios, early coordinated um, ambitious action is in development Asia's interest. Um, looking at employment in the energy sector, um, all regions of developing Asia will see an increase in energy sector employment under ambitious decarbonization. Compared to current policies, accelerated global net zero scenario creates 1.5 million additional jobs. So this is the left uh, chart. Um, about 1.4 million jobs in the coal sector are lost um, by 2050 in the region, while over 2.9 million jobs are created. Uh, these are mostly in the solar, uh, PV and wind generation. Uh, pursuit of uh, an ambitious decarbonization will lead to large changes in, in land use, um, as some agriculture land um, is diverted to produce biofuels um, and forest coverage also increases. This affects agriculture and also food affordability. So under current policies and NDC effort, food prices will fall in real terms as a result of technological progress. Whereas under the net zero scenarios, um, uh, we see an increase in food prices of approximately 25% by mid-century. Overall, the share of household expenditure on energy and food is expected to increase. So this is what you see in the chart here. As poorer households spend higher shares of their income on food, this effect will be distributionally regressive unless appropriate policies are introduced to mitigate to offset this effect. Um, so um, this is a... Um, and the last section of the report where we discuss policy options um, for the region. So based on the, the modeling findings, we offer policy recommendations um, for decarbonizing developing Asia within three mutually reinforcing pillars. 
The first pillar, uh, reforming prices, focuses on actions uh, to price carbon emissions and also remove negative carbon prices arising from subsidies and market distortions such as fossil fuel subsidies. And the second pillar, facilitating low carbon responses, focuses on policies that reduce barriers to decarbonization. These include policies and regulations um, and also subsidies to offset fossil fuel subsidies, establish demand for clean technologies, invest in, um, in knowledge, public goods, and leveraging private investment. Finally, the third pillar uh, is on ensuring fairness. Um, this uh, uh, pillar focuses on measures that will lead to more um, equitable international distribution of costs and are also domestic policies to shield lower income groups and vulnerable from the cost of climate policy. So, for example, we discuss carbon uh, revenue sharing, facilitating labor market transitions, and investing in public services for uh, vulnerable sectors. So to summarize uh, key messages of the report, Asia has a special stake in the global climate crisis as the region is um, climate vulnerable and will also determine whether Paris Agreement's goals can be met. National determined contributions will not meet Paris Agreement goals and fragmented net zero policies have far higher costs than coordinated policies. A globally coordinated approach to achieving global net zero has benefits far in excess of costs for developing Asia and costs are lower, the faster we act. Climate mitigation can increase energy sector employment, but it can also have price effects that are regressive unless they're accompanied by redistribution measures. There are however ample, oops, sorry. There is um, ample opportunity for developing Asia to accelerate to the transition. So we discussed several policy options in terms of reforming um, prices, regulatory improvements, and attention to fairness. So overall, I'll just end by saying that there's much more detail in the report that I could have possibly covered in my short presentation. So uh, I hope that you go to the ADB website and, and download and read the report for more information. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Manisha, for sharing the key findings of the report. Uh, we now welcome our four panelists to continue with further discussions. Uh, our panelists today are Ms. Noelle O'Brien, Chief of Climate Change and Disaster Risk Management Thematic Group, concurrently Director, uh, Climate Change and Disaster Risk Management Division of the ADB. Ms. Uh, Naida Mogadou, Senior Infrastructure Specialist for Innovation and Green Finance, Southeast Asia Regional Department of the ADB. Mr. David Reitzer, Economist at Economic Research and Development Impact Department of the ADB. Mr. Pradeep Tharakan, Regional Advisor for Energy Transition and Financing, South Asia Regional Department of the ADB. We welcome audience to post your questions in the Q&A box during the panel discussion. We will try to answer as many questions as we can during the um, discussion. Uh, the thematic report highlights the need to sweep the transition away from fossil fuels to cleaner sources of energy. Pradeep, you have 20 years of experience and rich knowledge on energy transition, energy policy, and environmental issues. You also lead the design, financing, and delivery of large public sector clean energy investment programs. Based on your work at the ADB in supporting energy transition in South Asia and Southeast Asia, can you discuss some of the challenges that the region faces in this regard? What role can MDBs such as ADB can play in supporting the energy transition? Thank you, Grace, and uh, good afternoon to all of the participants uh, uh, at, at this uh, event. Uh, I think uh, we've already heard about the need for large-scale financing, so that's a particular challenge, accessing financing. But rather than seeing it as a monolithic problem, I would actually break it down into perhaps three different buckets, if you will. The first case is not enough financing is flowing to certain kinds of end users. I mean, and transition finance is one particular area where that is quite evident. Um, I think Manisha mentioned the energy transition mechanism, which ADB is trying to develop, which is what is an effort towards that direction. So there aren't enough people willing to finance the transitioning from fossil fuel to clean energy. People are happy to finance clean energy on its own, but we know that there is, there is a large number of assets in the coal-fired power plant, fossil fuel sector generally, gas and, and with um, other kinds of fossil fuels, which will be operating for a long period of time into the future and contributing to emissions unless we bring in ways to accelerate their retirement. So that's gonna take a certain amount of dedicated financing. So that's one, one challenge. 
The second is, in some cases, finance is, is flowing at scale and or at reasonable cost you know, terms, but then we really need to make more of it available. Uh, we just need more of it. And, and that uh, in, in the case of ADB, what we are trying to do is, you know, there is a lot of talk about how MDBs can do more in the space. And so we are trying to stretch our balance sheet. Um, and there's a program that ADB recently announced called IFCAP, which is Innovative Finance Facility for Climate in Asia and the Pacific. So this is a, a really first of a kind landmark program where we are using a risk transfer combined with a guarantee program to actually create more headroom in our own lending capability. So we are expanding our balance sheet, so to, uh, so, so to speak. And that's going to allow us to lend up to $15 billion of more money for climate change in, in, in the near term. Um, and we've also done this with our clients. A really quick example is in India, where we've done credit enhancement products to improve the credit rating of domestic project bonds that are supporting renewable energy. Uh, and finally, really quickly, um, another challenge I think we need to start thinking about uh, is um, access to critical minerals and RE supply chains. There's something that's come up in the last few years. Bottlenecks, uh, much of the, the refining, the processing, of uh, key minerals that are needed for the energy transition, such as cobalt, nickel, graphite, and so on, and the production of components that are midstream uh, you know, when it comes to making wind turbines or solar uh, panels or electrolyzers. This is all highly concentrated in a few countries, and that leads to higher costs, bottlenecks, delays in projects, all of which translates into higher cost of capital. So we need to look at that as well. So ADB is embarking on a study to understand the implications of these supply chain bottlenecks for Asian uh, developing member countries, and then think of ways in which we can support our, uh, our clients. Let me stop here. Uh, thanks, uh, Pradeep. Uh, in this report, mobilizing capital uh, to investment in low carbon projects is listed as one uh, key policy response to facilitate the transition to net zero. Uh, I would like to turn to Naida. Uh, Naida lists the work that sets up various green investment funds and designs climate finance instruments in Southeast Asia, including ADB's Southeast uh, Asia Green Finance Hub and uh, the ASEAN Catalytic Green Finance Facility. Naida, in your view, what are the key challenges to attract investors to make green investments in developing Asia? What kind of policies can help channel more capital to low carbon investments? Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Shutian, for that for that question. And I think it builds nicely on on what Pradeep was, you know, clearly outlined. There is the, the challenges around the flows towards financing some more on the supply side. Uh, there are myriad challenges to mobilizing investment, uh, especially on the supply side. It depends uh, on the type of investment, institutional or commercial, where it's coming from, whether it's in the region or outside. But I think one persisting challenge that you see, which is more on the demand side and that continues to be a, an issue and one that ADB is trying to address at multiple levels is really a persisting lack of, uh, of, of bankable projects. Now you hear that all the time. And I think it's not a new problem. It's one that's been around for a while, but particularly around climate change, I think it's driven in Southeast Asia by two kind of major sets of, of factors. One is the fact that a lot of investment planning for sectors, energy, but beyond energy, transport, uh, you know, urban, um, is, is weak and doesn't necessarily take into account climate risk systematically, especially transition risk, which means, uh, for example, in the transport sector across many of our countries, we're not really seeing enough prioritization of a shift towards low carbon transport modes. This means there's less project opportunities that are out there because there isn't enough push for it, even at a sector investment planning level. Secondly, I think what we do note across our countries, uh, especially, is that there, most of the project pipelines that we have are highly disaggregated, very, very small, and not packaged in a way that would be even investable by uh, by any kind of you know investor at scale. So commercial banks aside, I mean, even institutional investment, the size of the pro most of the project opportunities just are too small and too disaggregated. So especially if you look at urban waste, major source of methane emissions, municipal waste, or energy efficiency in, in buildings, uh, very hard to finance currently if you're a commercial investor, even if you're a commercial bank, it's it's hard to push this kind of investment because the project, there's opportunity, but there's no and nothing to invest into, if you see what I'm saying. So all of this calls for a need for more significant public intervention, I think, as you outlined well in the report. Uh, uh, but I feel like what we could emphasize more is that this public intervention needs to come together in terms of policy planning and finance mobilization. So on your second point, what kind of policies um, do we need? What would an ideal policy framework look like to mobilize uh, investment at scale? 
um, I'd say probably three, three sets of things. First and foremost, uh, a core a strong climate policy. And you need that to set a target and a signal for investors that there is ambition on climate action, that it's not going to be backtracked, that so that reduces kind of regulatory risk. So by adopting a net zero goal, by you know committing to an NDC, even ones that maybe aren't as ambitious as needed to deliver a 1.5 degree goal, um, it's, but it's already a good start because it begins to lay out, you know, it says to investors, okay, we're serious and we're here and we've put this, we've put this out there. So that's one bit, strong core climate policy. Secondly, sector-specific regulations and standards that create a level playing field for low-carbon technologies. I think renewable energy, we've seen a big change, especially solar, some countries been in the, in the last few years. But low-carbon technologies goes way beyond that, as we know, um, transport sector, urban, agriculture. And so we need kind of st standards and regulation that is going to, you know, make sure that low carbon technologies, emerging technologies, have a uh, are competitive. So in the case of um, electric mobility, let's say you need incentives to enable manufacturing or import and rollout. You need removal of subsidies to support uh, the, the upscale, the you know, deployment of technology at scale. So that's the second second batch of sector specific regulations. And then the third thing I would say is going back to a point that Pradeep made too, it's really important to mobilize financing for transition. But this means you need a really strong standard because the issue around transition financing and greening of you know, carbon intensive activities is of course the risk of, of greenwashing. So by setting in, putting in place transition standards, you actually help increase confidence around investing in instruments like transition bonds. So in Southeast Asia, for example, the ASEAN, uh, the Association of Southeast Asia Nations, ASEAN, um, has actually adopted or is in the process of adopting their own taxonomy for sustainable finance for the region. And it's actually gone a few steps forward than others by, you know, proactively including a measurement of and criteria for uh, decommissioning of coal power in the context of the sustainable finance taxonomy. So that's actually a really good step forward uh, in terms of putting some kind of a boundary around it. Now we can start in the future questioning that boundary and tightening it up, but at least they've, they've put themselves out there. So that's, that's, uh, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Thanks. Thanks, Naida. Very comprehensive discussion on policy needs. Um, then uh, further to this, I would like to pass over to Neil since uh, Naida already talked about uh, mobilizing finance. Not only is uh, ADB's climate change work and has been working on uh, expanding mitigation investments and scaling up adaptation investments as well as rising uh, raising climate finance. Noel, the report finds uh, that hundreds of billion dollars additional annual investment is needed to uh, power supply alone in developing Asia to attain climate goals. And then Naida also just mentioned the importance of mobilizing finance. Um, ADB can only provide a small fraction of this. How can it be best positioned to help uh, support the low carbon transition? So thank you very much uh, for involving me into this afternoon's uh, webinar. Um, so ADB is adopting whole of economy and whole of a society approaches to drive the transition to low carbon development and achieve the net zero. So this means going beyond individual projects and sector silos and targeting the, the transformation of systems by organizing support across four key areas. So I'll talk about those. So the first one is understanding and anchoring the transformation according to the national context. So the opportunities, risks, and capabilities across countries, they will vary according to their climate change vulnerability and the greenhouse gas emissions profiles, but also the demographic structure, the economic profile, the development aspirations among many other factors. So a robust understanding of the national context is imperative in an identifying and designing support that is effective and responsive to the needs of the priorities of the DMCs. So at ADB, we're enhancing action to strengthen upstream climate change diagnostics. So to help the DMCs make evidence-based decisions to prioritize climate action and to build capacity in the DMCs to undertake and to use these diagnostics, which will also inform ADB's strategic focus. Now, Naida has talked about uh, the importance of policies 
and the ADO 2023 chapter uh, report has highlighted the need for proactive policies to create the conditions for low carbon innovation and investment. So it will be essential to create the right enabling environment by improving regulations, providing incentives and building capacities for enhanced public and private sector investments. Climate change will need to be treated as more than just an environmental agenda. <laughs> It needs to integrate low carbon development and climate resilience, as well as the principles of green economy and just transition. Supporting the development of ambitious climate policies and integrating in them, in the, sorry, integrating them into development and sector policies and plans can enable DMCs to maximize synergies and to manage the trade-offs across different development priorities. So at ADB, we're increasingly uh, using policy-based lending as a means of support to the DMCs to undertake those critical policy reforms in the climate change space. In 2022, we approved the first dedica dedicated climate change policy-based loan to support the Philippines. And we are also working with Bangladesh and Mongolia on new uh, policy-based lending instruments. Enhancing institutional capacity is also a critical part. Uh, there's a need to work with the MCs and to coordinate across the ministries to ensure coherence and consistencies of plans, policies, and programs. Now we know that often we work with individual ministries, but a lot of what needs to be done is to bring together the ministries of finance, climate, environment, planning, and the sector ministries. So we have a specific technical assistance, which is known as NDC Advance. And through this, we have already supported 17 DMCs to develop policies and plans to mobilize finance, and to build capacity for implementing monitoring NDCs, and also in some cases, charting to explore more ambitious NDCs. And bringing me to that last question, which you started with, which is securing the financial support. So we know that the government budgets will be inadequate to finance this needed transformations. So the DMCs will require support required to support to access international sources of climate finance and to develop innovative financing instruments and mobilize uh, the private sector support. The ADO thematic chapter has highlighted that the transformation of the energy sectors requires an increase in investments and a real allocation towards cleaner sources. And ADB is working with regional and global partners to scale up climate investments. You've heard mention of uh, the energy transition mechanism, uh, but also you've heard the uh, Pradeep make reference to the um, IFCAP, the Innovating Finance for Climate in Asia and Pacific, which this will use guarantees of ADB's sovereign loan portfolios to leverage additional billions of dollars for that much needed climate investment. We're also working with partners on other initiatives such as the GCF, the GEF. We work with partners on the SIP. Um, we also noted the importance of carbon pricing in the ADO uh, thematic report um, and the role that this can play in achieving a net zero world. So at ADB, we've built strong expertise in carbon markets, carbon pricing through the carbon market program. We've also successfully mobilized carbon finance through the Asia Pacific Carbon Fund, the Future Carbon Fund, the Japan Fund for the Joint Crediting Mechanisms. And we're continuing to enhance the capacity of DMCs through technical support with our technical support facility and also the Article 6 support facility. So lots going on, so back to you. Thanks, Noel. 
a very comprehensive discussion and also a very amazing progress that ADB can contribute uh, to climate change work. Now, uh, I would like to turn to David, also a, a co-lead of this report. David is an ADB researcher working on many topics related to climate change, environment and behavior economics. He's also an expert of climate modeling. David, the report emphasizes uh, three policy pillars, uh, one of which is carbon pricing. Actually, Noel also mentioned the importance of carbon pricing just now. What is the status of carbon pricing in the region? How can uh, carbon pricing be expanded? And is there scope for carbon trade between Asian uh, countries? Oh, okay, uh, Grace, uh, thank you for, for those questions. Um, Carbon pricing is incredibly important because there is no other policy that can ensure that decarbonization occurs at lowest cost, that the lowest cost opportunities to reduce emissions are the target of emissions reduction. A good carbon pricing policy can enable that outcome. Within developing Asia, there's been important progress in carbon pricing. Uh, a couple of major developments have been the Chinese national emissions trading uh, system and also that Indonesia now is also developing a national emissions trading system for coal-fired power plants that's supposed to come online uh, within the year. Um, so th th there's very important progress, uh, but there's also very much uh, to do to enhance carbon pricing in the region. The, the pricing uh, coverage still trails that of other regions, particularly advanced economies. A uh, much smaller share of emissions uh, would be covered. Uh, there would be um, essentially exemptions that are, are provided. And there are also barriers to carbon pricing, uh, such as rigidities from power purchase agreements um, and other characteristics of major emitting sectors, such as power. Uh, the, the limit, the, the practical uh, effect of those uh, pricing mechanisms that are in place. Uh, the levels of carbon pricing also in developing Asia are far below those of uh, other regions of the world. So the, the ETS types of prices that you would find in the PRC, for example, would be around a tenth of those of the EU. Um, so there, there's also uh, a lot of ability to, to increase prices, although prices have been increasing, which is, is a movement in the right direction. At, at the same time as, as some movement is, is happening towards pricing, there are also still a lot of negative carbon prices uh, that one finds in developing Asia in the form of subsidies uh, to emitting fuels and emitting activities. So these take the form of fossil fuel subsidies, uh, subsidies uh, to agriculture, subsidies to agricultural inputs, the subsidies that encourage uh, production of input intensive agricultural products. So there are also uh, more uh, less obvious subsidies in, in terms of how land is administered, uh, which conditions natural capital, deforestation, land cover. All these areas are areas where actually these negative carbon prices can be eliminated at, at negative cost. It can actually reduce uh, cost to governments uh, to, to introduce this pricing. Um, and, and even the level of those uh, negative prices could be near to the, the kind of cost uh, that the, we find in the report for developing Asia under a net zero world. Finally, if the, we did have developing Asia move much more towards carbon pricing uh, if there's more ambition around climate policy, more effort and international coordination, there's a lot of potential actually for, for carbon trade within developing Asia. Developing Asia both has major countries like the PRC, which are actually above global average per capita emissions, as well as very low per capita emissions uh, countries uh, such, such as India. So as we move forward, and as under economic development, because peaking of emissions uh, still is in the future for the PRC, even as we need to tighten the global carbon budget, uh, there could be potential, it would be lower, it would, we find that it could be higher cost for the PRC to really push emissions 
very far down than it would be to say support India uh, to, to keep emissions low. And so there could be great potential within developing Asia for carbon trade. It doesn't need to be the way we've kind of traditionally thought of things that it would be developed countries who sort of need to only developed countries would finance the low carbon development of, of developing countries. But even within uh, the developing Asian region, there could be potential for for win-win collaboration uh, through through carbon markets. Ultimately, thank you. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, we we now have uh, many questions coming into the Q and A box. So uh, let me pick some uh, questions from the floor and then uh, toss to our uh, panelists. Uh, the first question we've got is uh, uh, from Reason uh, Saha. Um, his question is uh, how Asian developing countries will comply with net zero approach of maritime industry to cut 50% of CO2. Please explain. Um, uh, Pradeep, do you wish to comment um, uh, on this question? Sure, yeah, I mean, I can come in briefly. I think the maritime shipping industry is, is definitely one of the more challenging ones to decarbonize. And we are at a very early stage. And much of the innovation we're seeing is actually happening in Europe. Um, just to uh, you know, highlight a couple of areas, uh, I think large shipping companies are now looking at alternative fuels um, for their you know, ocean going uh, vessels. There are there is a lot of debate about which is the right fuel is should it be methanol or should it be ammonia, um, and there are pros and cons for each of them. Um, methanol is safer to use; it's not toxic, um, but at the same time, uh, you know, eventually we will have to go to ammonia because methanol is not entirely net zero. It all depends on how you you're getting the CO two that you need to produce the methanol. On the other hand, ammonia. The technologies are not there yet. It is toxic, and also it is difficult to transport that at ambient conditions. So all of this debate around fuels, but what we're seeing is that in terms of where companies are putting their money, uh, most of the large companies are now ordering methanol-based uh, uh, vessels because they're also dual fuel, and eventually they might move to ammonia. So that's what's happening on the shipping front. Um, just to maybe pick up an example of a developing country such as India, they have recently announced a fair number of policies looking at maritime shipping um, net zero programs. So on the port side, they've got a, a green port policy that requires ports to uh, electrify more of their operations. It also allows for um, you know, programs focused on green tugs. So these are the vessels that actually you know, uh, pull these larger ocean going vessels into harbors and then looking at ways to sort of uh, make them greener. And then they're also putting in place programs for um, you know, prioritizing greener shipping by saying, look, if you have a, a green vessel, you've got alternative fuels being used, you'll have priority berthing rights. Um, and also you, you might actually get some subsidies in place. So all of this is being discussed. I think India is an example of, of how um, countries in the region are beginning to think about this, but we are at a very early stage. There's a lot more to be done when it comes to maritime shipping. Let me stop here, thank you. Uh, thanks, Pradeep. Uh, maybe Noel, you may also wish to add a bit on this question. Sure, and I can really just add some some of the specifics that ADB is doing in in this area. Um, so our transport team have a number of initiatives. Um, we've supported electric vessels, um, maritime vessels, uh, for example, with the deployment of e ferries in Thailand. Um, as Pradeep mentioned, alternative fuels are going to be an essential part of um, reducing the emissions from the maritime sector. So as things stand, currently ADB is really still just exploring, studying low carbon alternative fuel options for shipping. And I think the point that Pradeep has brought up about the work in India on green port design, this is an essential area because um, the the maritime sector is such a regional global uh, business. If we just look at how the container business evolved in, 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 in the shipping industry, we have to look at changes in that way. So uh, we're working on green port design principles. Um, and within that, some of also uh, looking with the, the future um, tools to look at how smart ports can evolve with various countries in the region. Um, but also, we're also pushing for re reforms through our healthy ocean agenda. 
And, and this has, has a lot of strong co-benefits with greening. Um, I just want to note, to just a cautionary note at this time, ADB does, we don't currently have fixed timelines or quantified timelines in the maritime sector. There There's so many other areas that we're working on. So back to you. Uh, thanks, Noel. Uh, we have uh, some questions related to the report. I think, David, I will uh, definitely uh, toss these questions to you. The first one is um, uh, from, uh, oh, the, the first one is from uh, Mohit Kuma. I think he wanted to uh, understand why the graphs behave differently for developing Asia under the same policies as shown in the second slide. And then another one is uh, to wish to clarify why transportation costs significantly going down eventually um, after mid of the century. Um, and then the third one is, is to clarify about uh, uh, how did the how did uh, uh, the report model integrated power system planning to ensure efficient uh, sufficient capacity and flexibility of um, power grid system in the accelerated uh, scenario? Thanks, David. Uh, okay, uh, thank you. Those are those are uh, great questions. So the the for the first question, I believe the question is on the emissions pathways for the scenarios why the shape of the emissions pathways looks different for developing Asia under the scenarios than it does for the world. Um, and, and that's because uh, the context of developing Asia is not the same as the world altogether. So under our different scenarios, uh, we have current policies. Current policies are different in developing Asian countries than they are for, the, for other countries in the world. They're in a different stage of economic development. Uh, for NDCs, the NDCs that are pledged by developing Asian countries are, are also different. Not every country of the world has put the same one forward. Net zero pledges also differ. Um, and then under the, the kind of global net zero scenarios, uh, the, 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 we're assuming that there's a global carbon market. Um, so basically, if a, if a country or region has higher mitigation costs, and it's cheaper to pay some other country or region to do the mitigation instead, uh, then that, that's what happens. And so when you look in the very long term, and, and there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of afforestation that's taking place, there's a lot of uh, negative emissions technology from biomass with CCS when you're going out to 2100, uh, those things happen more in less population dense areas. So more population dense regions end up, you know, paying for sort of carbon credits from those areas. So, so there are basically differences in developing Asia versus the world as a whole, which means that it comes out a bit differently. Um, when it comes to the transportation uh, cost question, that's that's a that's a, a well spotted question. Um, what that question refers to is that when you look at the effect of uh, the net zero scenario on transportation expenditures by households, you see this sort of uh, counterintuitive pattern in that initially they, they would cause transportation co expenditures to go up and in the long run, then they go down. Um, that, that's because basically under, under a net zero kind of world, you know, you're changing uh, the, the capital stock of transportation, you're changing the kinds of vehicles that people buy so that they're much more electrified, electric vehicles are adopted faster, um, transport infrastructure is, is changed. And so initially before all these changes occur and as they're occurring, uh, that pushes costs, the expenditures higher for households. Uh, but in the long run, the sort of more efficient infrastructure, the electrified vehicle fleets, et cetera, uh, have, in the long run, lower costs for people to use. So, so that's why you see this this sort of puzzling pattern. Um, on the on the question in in terms of uh, sort of grid integration, you know, what did we? How did we consider uh, the fact that uh, renewable uh, sources of, of power have intermittency issues? Um, that's a, it's a very valid question, um, but basically that is reflected in the way the model works. Um, there are uh, flexibility constraints that are posed on different kinds of power. 
Um, there are uh, capacity constraints that are imposed as, as an individual in, intermittent share increases uh, as the, the share of, of, of uh, electricity generation. Um, and there's, there's modeling of, of uh, grid storage and, and grid capital that then have to increase to accommodate uh, the, these kind of intermittent sources. Um, if you wanna really look at the details exactly of how that's done, there's public documentation of the which model. Uh, so if you Google uh, which which model integrated assessment you'll find the you'll find the the website where there all the documentation is put and you can read in, in detail about how it works. Thank you. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, there is another question from Akba. Uh, it's about uh, technology. So the question is uh, how and what are commitments for developing. Uh, for developing countries in assisting the development and transfer of new uh, renewable energy, uh, renewable energy technology to developing countries. Uh, I will first invite Naida to uh, comments and then maybe Pradeep can add something. Naida, please. Thank you. Thanks, Shutian. Um, so I think if you think of technology transfer, especially in the context of the UNFCCC as a kind of a you know, a series of steps, right? Starting from incubation of new technology to development, to deployment and diffusion, financing, support, um, but also knowledge um, and capacity, et cetera, from developed countries to developing, and I would argue between developing countries, uh, is kind of really critical to, will, will be critical, and it continues to be critical to really scale up efforts on the low carbon transition. And the entry points for, for what countries are doing now, both developed countries in developing, we're also developing and developing, so countries with each other at, at multiple levels. So I think technical assistance, number one, really important to strengthen the enabling environment and building capacity for scale up of or, or, or uh, development of new technologies or even transfer of technologies from one country to the other. So particularly TA that supports universities, research institutions, research networks, uh, financing of research in new areas, already critical for sort of early stage projects. Uh, then I, I would argue for the scale up of technologies, you also need technical assistance again, uh, critically for the preparation of projects. So even actually for pretty much, you know, for, for, for technologies that are relatively mature, for uh, us to be able to, or for anybody to be able to finance them, often you need a lot of local information, knowledge, assessments, upstream work, that technical assistance uh, is very useful to do the work on to enable a, a project to come to fruition, which essentially means, you know, technology transfer, realization of that. Uh, then I would say financing of direct investments in renewable energy, especially first of a kind projects in a country that help demonstrate feasibility and create comfort among financiers. So for, from ADB's perspective, a lot of what our private sector operations department do with uh, even mature technologies, but in a new country setting, for example, uh, help to create a kind of a, a pathway towards uh, other investors coming in and, and financing. It also kind of realizes technology transfer over time. And finally, I think critical point, especially for more mature uh, renewable energy technologies, I think using public funds more catalytically to mobilize private and commercial investments. Again, similarly, how we, how we do it at the ADB, but also at other development banks, really focusing on mobilization of private capital for every dollar of public finance is really important to, again, scale up technologies kind of uh, which are the most mature. So those are the kind of four steps, but one thing just to add, because there was another question as well, is that it's really critical that both the TA and the financing goes together with one or the other, without the other is difficult to achieve anything at scale. So all the four steps I outlined would need to kind of, you'd need the technical assistance and financing support to go together to really see scale up quickly. Thanks, Thanks Naida. Uh, Pradeek, uh, do you want to add something? Yeah, just briefly. Um... In addition to you know the technical assistance and sort of the early stage support that Naida mentioned, there's also a large amount of fund flows um, that developed countries are making available to developing countries already. Now it's nowhere close to the hundred billion per year target that we all know about, but but it is not uh, ins insignificant either. I mean, and these come through various channels. You've got the global climate funds, which are often populated um, significantly by contributions by developed countries. And you have the Article Six, which eventually, once that that um, you know goes mainstream, would be another opportunity for for G two G arrangements where developed countries can then partner with developing countries to undertake uh, carbon reduction projects. And then finally, I think more recently, we've been seeing the development of what's called Just Energy Transition Partnerships or JETPs. These are primarily focused on transition finance. So these are programs that the G seven has put in place 
uh, particularly in Indonesia, an agreement has been signed in South Africa, and they are in early discussions uh, in Vietnam and, and potentially one other country. So here the idea is that the G7 would put together resources in collaboration with the multilateral development banks and the private sector to come together to really help governments put in place the requisite policy, the pipeline development and financing, both through the public and private sector of accelerating uh, coal to clean energy projects. So just wanted to mention that, that we do have fairly large fund flows that are currently available alongside technical assistance and uh, technology assistance. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Pradeep. Uh, due to time constraints, I think uh, I will just pick the last questions. Uh, the last question is from uh, Vishwa. Uh, how can international organizations, creditor, uh, creditors, entities uh, push for stable and sustainable long-term policy making for countries, especially during a time that many countries are fighting issues such as inflation? Um, Noel, uh, do you want to uh, comment on this question? Thanks. Um, sure, thanks. And really just a couple of items that I, I will pick with the with the short time. I mean, I, I think what I've set out in my earlier messages about bringing together ministries so we have coherent efforts at the country level is really important. Um, uh, Pradeep just brought up the question of JetP and this importance of bringing together a platform of actors. And I think this is something that we that is being promoted not just by ADB now, but also some of the other MDBs um, to bring together the actors at the country level on particular platforms. So moving beyond not just energy, but to low car low emissions uh, tran transitioning in other sectors, for example, in transport and urban and agriculture, but also in the adaptation space. So I think this is an area where you'll see a lot more um, uh, work on in the coming months. Um, another area we've we've mentioned it already, but how do we bring together uh, policy changes? How do we use policy-based loans to make those critical changes that remove barriers and provide the incentives for the kind of transitions that are required? I think it's really important to remember that just with um, that there are a lot of opportunities for growth that can come with um, uh, energy, with transitioning our economies. But one of the things I'd just like to highlight before we leave today's uh, talk is on the importance of just transition. So we also really need to make sure that no particular group of people or groups of workers are left behind with this, uh, with the transition. And this is an area where ADB is doing a lot more work um, and growing our efforts. We, we launched a, a just transition support platform um, at COP in, in 2027 last year. Um, and this is part of our commitment to ensuring that the benefits of this shift to low carbon um, are, um, are across the whole of the economy and across all communities. And maybe I'll leave it there since we're already over the time. Thanks a lot, Noel. Uh, thanks to our presenter and panelists for a very comprehensive discussion. Um, we, we are now running for almost one hour. Uh, we still have a lot of questions unaddressed, but uh, sorry, we have to <clears throat> leave them there. Uh, for your information, both the full uh, ADO them uh, thematic report and then the webinar recording are available on ADB's website at www.adb.org. Before we conclude, I wish to let you know that our next Asian Impact Webinar will be held next week on uh, June 15th. The topic is uh, Project uh, uh Technology to Link to uh, Financial Markets in ASEAN Plus 3. We have uh, one presenter and four panelists to show how better and more reliable settlement can better integrate financial markets in Southeast Asia, China, Korea, and Japan. Please go to ADB website to register for it, and then we look forward to seeing you again soon. With this, uh, let me thank everyone for joining us today. See you next time.